But over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be reviewing evidence for warfarin therapy and stroke prevention um, in atrial fibrillation. We'll talk about some of the logistical barriers with warfarin therapy, and this is something that I came to know very well um, being the manager of the anticoagulation clinic at Brigham and Women's, and hopefully talk just a little bit about um, new and emerging therapies for stroke uh, prevention. So a little bit of background, stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States, and over about 150 people die each year of stroke in the United States. We know that of all strokes, about 87% are ischemic, 10% are, are from intracerebral hemorrhage, and 3% are subarachnoid hemorrhage. Atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke by about five-fold, so that's a big increase. And we also know that strokes that are associated with atrial fibrillation are actually more severe than those um, from other causes. And they really have an increased morbidity, mortality, and just poor functional outcome. So preventing these strokes is incredibly important to our patients. Atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia, and about two million Americans are currently living with AFib. Dr. Estes, in a much fancier slide than I have, <laughs> clearly went over exactly what happens in atrial fibrillation. And we do know that AFib can cause congestive heart failure as well as stroke. We've talked a lot about the CHAD score and how important it is for us to risk stratify our patients and evaluate which patients are candidates for either aspirin therapy, um, aspirin or warfarin, or warfarin therapy multiple antithrombotic medications that have been evaluated in randomized controlled studies to decrease the risk of stroke in AF, but for a very, very long time, much like Dr. Goldhaber said, the only um, medication that was really able to prove reduction in stroke prevention was warfarin. We know that in patients in such as warfarin, aspirin, and dabigatran are now all approved to reduce the risk of stroke, which is very exciting, and that uh, vitamin K antagonists are extremely effective in preventing adjusted, <laughs> adjusted dose warfarin. We're actually able to reduce the risk of stroke by about two-thirds versus placebo. Now, many of these trials um, where we looked in big randomized trials evaluating warfarin therapy for stroke were done a very long time ago. And we have seen that the overall observed rates of strokes have been reduced in more recent studies. So sometimes that can make us question as to whether um, the smaller absolute benefit that we're seeing in therapies that are being trialed now might be associated with that overall reduction. And the other thing that always comes to my mind um, after being in a clinic where we managed about 2,500 patients um, on warfarin therapy is whether or not the clinical benefits of warfarin therapy that we saw in randomized controlled studies was actually able to be translated into the real world. So in randomized controlled studies, you have a bunch of investigators who are really tightly controlling situations, and it's really important to main pa maintain patients within their therapeutic range, whereas sometimes in the real world, we know that we have patients with... Um, with challenging living situations and other things that really make keeping patients within their target range incredibly challenging. So there are major safety concerns with warfarin, and the one that when I was managing the anticoagulation clinic kept me up the most at night was the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. And basis, I would go home and say, oh my gosh, I really hope that that patient took that warfarin the way I told them to, because I'm really worried about um, the potential for a bleed. And we know that there are tons of predictors for major bleeding. Some of them are you know, the use of multiple antiplatelet and anticoagulant medications, advanced patient's age, as well as over anticoagulation. And the thing that's unfortunate about this is some of these, like advanced patient age, there's just not a lot that we can do about to uh, prevent. There have been studies that have looked at target INR ranges and the risk of thromboembolism as well as intracranial hemorrhage um, with varying INR ranges. So for most atrial fibrillation, we try to keep their target range between 2.0 and 3.0. And you can see that this red line here represents thromboembolism, and this dotted blue line represents uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. So as your INR increases, and at the point where it gets to about 5, 
um, you can see that your risk for intracranial hemorrhage increases significantly. Similarly, as you uh, decrease your INR, so as your INR goes to about 1.8 or lower, your risk for thromboembolism will increase um, as well. So again, being working in an anticoagulation clinic, this is the thing that I struggle the most with. How do I keep all of my patients in a target INR range between two and three so that we can prevent things like intracranial hemorrhage as well as um, strokes? We know that INR values significantly below two can increase the risk of stroke. There's actually a four to six fold increase in INR um, of 1.3 compared to an INR of 2.0 or above. There have been some trials that have uh, specifically looked at whether or not patients that are elderly and very frail should have a lower target INR, and also whether or not patients that are at very high risk for stroke should actually be tried to maintain at a higher INR. And the end result of most of those studies have shown that regardless of how old you are and um, you know how much at risk you are for stroke, for AFib, for stroke prevention, we really should try to keep you with your INR are between two and three. Now, warfarin is one of the top 10 most prescribed drugs within the United States. I think that's something that a lot of folks don't realize, and sometimes I think that being on warfarin can be a little bit isolating. Um, so it might be nice to know for our patients in the room that you're not the only one that's on warfarin. Warfarin is the most widely used oral anticoagulant, and it has been for the past 65 years. About 3 million patients annually receive 32 million prescriptions annually in the United States for war warfarin. And in addition to being one of the most common drugs, it's also one of the most logistically challenging medications. Um, drug interactions are a real problem with warfarin. So it's one of those medications that tends to interact with a lot of other medications, uh, specifically antibiotics. There's also a ton of variable dosing regimens. So we really can't predict um, which patient is going to need which dose. So sometimes I would have a 90-year-old uh, patient who required six milligrams of warfarin a day who was probably about 70 pounds, and then I would have a football player that was 250 pounds and required 0 0.5 milligrams of warfarin a day. So you really can't tell how much warfarin any patient is going to need based on any of their physical characteristics. There are tons of dietary interactions, which again makes things challenging for our patients, and all of this focus on time and therapeutic range um, is, is incredibly important. And the importance of time and therapeutic range, I think, was really highlighted in a trial that Dr. Goldhaber mentioned earlier um, called the ACTIVE trial. And I want to talk a little bit about this, especially for our patients in the room, so that they understand why uh, the clinicians in the anticoagulation management service are being so obsessive about making sure that their INR is always between two and three. So in the ACTIVE trial, we had patients um, that had evidence of atrial fibrillation age greater than 75 or a prior stroke. The goal of the study was to prevent vascular events comparing the safety and efficacy of warfarin versus aspirin and clopidogrel. Now clopidogrel is an antiplatelet agent um, that's been used in various other forms. This trial was actually stopped early because of an increase in heart attacks and strokes in patients that were in that aspirin and clopidogrel arm versus those on warfarin. So this trial went on for a little while, they looked at the data and they said, oh my gosh, we have to stop this trial because the people that are on warfarin are doing so much better than those on um, aspirin and clopidogrel. There was also this trend towards more bleeding in this clopidogrel and aspirin group versus the warfarin group. And you can see this data represented here. So um, this axis is bad things that happen, so stroke, um, some type of embolic event, MI, or vascular death. And you can see that the line for clopidogrel and aspirin is higher than with the oral anticoagulant at the time, which was warfarin. Major bleeding was again very similar between um, the two groups, but there was a trend towards higher um, bleeding with clopidogrel and aspirin versus warfarin. But what's incredibly important from an anticoagulation clinic's perspective is that even though this study was stopped early because warfarin was found to be so much better than aspirin and clopidogrel, in patients where the time in therapeutic range or their INR control was less than 65% of the time, 
there was actually almost no difference between the two groups. And all of the benefit was actually seen in these folks who had time and therapeutic range greater than 65%. So for patients who uh, were in their target INR for greater than 65% of the time, clopidogrel and aspirin was far worse than warfarin. But for those that weren't well controlled on warfarin, there was almost no difference. So for patients that are in the audience, when your clinicians are being crazy about making sure that your INR is not 1.7, but rather 2.0, that's why we're doing it. Because we want you to be in your uh, target INR range for as long a period as possible. So when I think about what would be the ideal anticoagulant, um, I would love an anticoagulant that you could administer orally so that patients didn't have to give themselves injections. Ideally, it would be one drug at one dose for all patients. Um, it would be used routinely and for an average duration. It would be relatively inexpensive because I'm a cost girl and I always think about expense. Um, it would have predictable efficacy, a rapid onset of action, and no need for therapeutic monitoring. So I know that for patients that are on warfarin, some actually become a very um, type A around their anticoagulant management. And the idea of being on a medication that doesn't need to be monitored can be very unsettling. But when we think about the vast majority of medications, and as a pharmacist, this is what I think about, the vast majority of medications, we don't monitor. There's no level to monitor um, most antibiotics in your system. So, but yet we know that they work. So you don't really need a drug level to know a drug is working. So this brings us to you know the, the latest uh, FDA-approved new oral anticoagulant, Abigatran, which is a specific competitive for reversible thrombin inhibitor. Um, I'm a pharmacy geek, so I, I like to talk about pharmacology. So the way that this drug works is it inhibits free and fibrin brown thrombin activity. Like Dr. Goldhaber said, it's a pro-drug. It's rapidly converted into its active form as soon as it hits the gut. It has a really quick onset of action, so about two hours after you take the medication, there is some activity within the body. Um, it has a relatively decent half-life, about 12 hours, and it is renally cleared, so that means that your kidneys have to be working um, well in order to clear the medication. And this is the RELY trial, which again we've talked a lot about today. Um, it was a study in patients with atrial fibrillation, and the study looked at folks that were on warfarin, dose adjusted, and then two different doses of dabigatran, 110 and 150 milligrams twice a day. And much like Dr. Goldhaber said earlier, we found that there was a significant uh, risk reduction in patients on dabigatran, 150 milligrams, versus patients on warfarin for the prevention of stroke or any other type of systemic embolism. And, if, and when we looked at stroke alone, we found that there was a significant uh, decrease in the incidence of stroke with this medication. Again, also very interesting here is that we saw that there was no increase in uh, hemorrhagic stroke between these two groups. So that this new medication, dabigatran, 150 milligrams twice a day, um, was actually lower than warfarin when it came to hemorrhagic strokes, which again was something that I think that most people, when we were um, thinking about this medication coming out, that there might have been a benefit to stroke reduction, but then often that benefit of stroke reduction um, could have been outweighed by an increase in bleeding risk, but that's just not what we saw in this particular study. So to summarize, I just want to take away a few key points here is that AFib is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. In patients with significant risk factors, warfarin therapy has been proven effective with the positive net clinical benefits. However, long-term logistics around warfarin making ther makes therapy really challenging for our patients. Um, I think Bigatran, as well as some of the other oral anticoagulants, once the FDA gives our ruling on them and, and starts approving them, hopefully, um, we'll see some promising alternatives for stroke prevention in patients with AF.